Si quieres ver el mismo video en español, algo por polsku, or in other languages, mira la descripción abajo. Hello everyone, today we are starting with two questions. What do the countries marked on the map have in common? And why do some very old words in Hindi and English sound similar? Now let's have a look at these words. Name. Name. Nam. Nam. Door. Door. Dwar. Dwar. These two questions are connected to the topic of today's video. The way languages are connected or related to each other greatly affects the difficulty of learning them. That's why today we'll talk exactly about this. Before we get into the definition, we'll assume one thing, namely that all languages evolve, morph and change constantly. It manifests itself when we consider the way of speaking of the older generation to be a bit old fashioned. On the other hand, we also regard the innovations of the younger generation to be unnecessary fads. However, it doesn't mean that if you're older, you cannot invent words. Think about the word meme, which was invented by Richard Dawkins when he was well into his 30s. Some languages and their respective countries have cultures, traditions or strong organizations that try to keep the language in check. They just want the language to evolve in certain directions, in the good directions. Take French, for example, which has its Académie Française. But no matter how powerful these organizations are, language cannot be completely tamed. And so, Académie Française will not disallow people to use words or phrases like C'est trop cool. Life finds a way. Language cannot be controlled. Now we are going to look at a great example of the evolution of languages. We'll look at a passage from the Bible and we'll see how it looks now in the modern Bible and how it looked like 600 years ago. Well, the, the Bible is not easy to read today, but the Bible from 600 years ago is just super difficult. It has lots of words that don't exist today anymore. Here we have another doubt. Languages evolve, but what's about the number of all languages? Did we always have the same number of languages in the past? In reality, in parallel to English, there are lots of other languages which don't exist anymore today. They just got extinct on the way. To show a different an opposite phenomenon, now we'll have a look at a different language, Latin. Latin, like English, evolved a lot. Many people complained about it, many people tried to stop it, but no one could, no one managed to do that. Latin not only evolved a lot, but also was divided into new languages, which today we know as Spanish, French, Portuguese, Italian, Romanian and others. Today, the language is still taught and for many professions, it's a must but almost no one communicates in Latin anymore. Quite a nonsense what you two say is. Okay. What? Cool, with these two examples we can finally define what it means for two languages to be related. We will say that two languages are related when one of the following conditions is met. One language is derived from another, such as Spanish from Latin. Or two languages are derived from the same language, for example, Italian and Spanish are derived from Latin. Okay, here we have another doubt. What if all languages are derived from a single language? Does it mean that all languages are related? Yes, in this case we would say that all languages are related. But the above definition would still be useful. We could say things like English is more related to German than to Chinese. It's a bit like a kinship between people. I can be related to my brother because we have the same father and I can be related to my cousin because we have the same grandfather. To this, I can just add that I'm more closely related to my brother than to my cousin. Another similarity between humans and languages is that two languages, even though not related, might be quite similar to each other. More similar than two languages that are related. For example, English and French are super similar in terms of vocabulary. More similar than English and German. And all of this despite the close relationship between German and English. You are who you hang out with. The French visited England for a long time in the past. Also, we have to be careful. Just because two languages come from nearby regions doesn't mean that these two languages are closely related. Take Chinese and Korean, for example. They are not related and very different from each other. Okay, now we are going to change the context a bit. It is the year 1583. We are now in Goa, a Portuguese colony in what is now India. A Jesuit stationed there is freaking out because of the similarities that he sees between the languages of India and languages that he, as a Jesuit, knows quite well. Greek and Latin. Imagine how weird it felt. As such, there has been no 
big direct contact between India and Europe for centuries. The last time such great contact took place was when Alexander the Great traveled to India on his way to conquer the whole world. But afterwards, there was no such a big contact. So what's the reason for the existence of these similar words? Okay, another story. It is now the year 1665, almost a hundred years later. The Ottoman traveler Elia Celebi arrives to Vienna, the capital of the Habsburg Empire. Similar story. He begins to marvel at the similarities between the German language and the Persian language. Today, the Persian language, also known as Farsi, is the national language of Iran. And not much more. But back then, it was the language of aristocracy in many kingdoms or empires, like, for example, the Ottoman Empire or Mughal Empire. That was who built Taj Mahal. Now let's compare these two words from Persian and German. Leiche, Leiche, Lose, Lose, Stern, Stern, Setare, Setare. And so the more travels, colonizations, and conquests there were in the Middle East and India, the more of those similarities were detected. Today we are convinced that there had existed a language from which many languages of Europe and many languages of India are derived. The most widely accepted theory today, the so-called the Kurgan hypothesis, states that there was a people living in the beautiful steppes of Eastern Europe and Central Asia that spoke a language. These people were super successful. Their descendants, their language or dialects spread to the south, to India, and to the west, to Europe. Today, the language that was used by this group of people is called Indo-European language. Although we do not have anything written in this Proto-Indo-European language, we know quite a bit about it, thanks to the really smart techniques from the modern linguistics. We're going to talk about them in a separate video. The languages that descend from this original Proto-Indo-European language are called Indo-European languages. Okay. With these stories, I can finally answer the first question from this video. The countries shown here on the map are countries where the majority of population speaks some Indo-European language as their mother tongue. But we have to be super careful, because both in India and in Europe we have lots of languages that do not descend from this Proto-Indo-European language. They're not Indo-European languages. The history of some of these languages is still a mystery today. It is super interesting to see that due to historical twists, not only Proto-Indo-European was successful, but also his children and grandchildren. Think of Americas that only 500 years ago had lots of its own indigenous languages, and today almost all of them are extinct. Now the last that remain are way less prestigious than Spanish, English, Portuguese and French. All four Indo-European. Other languages also were super successful. German, Russian, Polish, Persian, and lots of languages in India, about which I'm not going to talk here, we'll have a separate video for that. Also, nowadays everyone learns English, so Indo-European languages basically ruled the world. Today, practically the half of the world's population speaks an Indo-European language as their mother tongue. In this video, I've shown you similarities between languages mostly of lexical nature, that is, similarities in vocabulary. But all these Indo-European languages, or related languages in general, have other similarities as well. Like, for example, grammar. The mere fact that languages such as Russian and Hindi have verb conjugation, that is, they change verb endings, is already a significant similarity. We are lucky that English belongs to this enormous Indo-European language family. Because when we start to learn a foreign language, it's gonna be automatically a bit easier. For example, Hindi will not be difficult for English speakers. All other things being equal, on average, it is going to be easier to learn a foreign language for an English speaker than for a Japanese speaker. You drive me crazy. You drive me crazy. As for the second question from the beginning of this video, I already answered it partially. Simply, Hindi and English have a common ancestor. And this common ancestor had already had words for door and name. Then these words descended both to India and to Europe. But until today, these words remain a bit similar. Paradoxically, sometimes we can detect these Indo-European similarities only when we start to learn a non-Indo-European language. Here we are starting to talk about non-Indo-European languages. There will be a separate video for that too. And for today, that's it. 
I encourage you to subscribe and see you soon.